This is Creative Banter, a creativity and philosophy-focused podcast hosted by Cody Schultz and Ben Horn. Ben has recently begun shipping off his 2022 portfolio box sets, which brings up the topic of deadlines and how we deal with them on an individual basis. Primarily, we discuss whether we place more value on extrinsic deadlines over intrinsic ones. This leads to a discussion about ebooks once again, along with a bit of a tease regarding one I am currently working toward. Our conversation takes a turn toward the seasons we find to be most difficult, as well as our valuing of images which whisper rather than shout. We end the discussion with a topic suggestion sent in by Roger over on our Discord, which regards movement. Let's dive right into it, shall we? today ben i'm in the process of preparing the pre-ordered portfolios for shipping and so kind of going through all the the various uh stages of that it's i mean things are coming together pretty smoothly and i gotta say it's it's pretty cool to have like the final product in hand um, with all the the textures and the materials and stuff and um, so it's just been a, a methodical process of going through I, on the table behind me here. I have about 40 of them that have already been, um, uh, packed, getting close to ready to ship them. Um, I'm not doing any plastic on them this year. So I'm wrapping the final portfolios in, uh, like some tissue paper, and then that's going to go inside the, the boxes. Okay. Uh, it's kind of like a folding mailer to ship. So though I'll be doing that a little later today, but, uh, but yeah, it's it's quite the process putting it together, um, but it is it is nice to finally see that project coming to a close, because um, I don't know about you, but I, I find it to be very, very rewarding to finish out a project and to not have it hanging over yeah. my head. I, I, I very much despise having like things looming above me, especially things that involve... Um, a lot of work. Yeah, that's how I felt about the ebook when I was when I was doing that. Yeah. Just, there, I mean, there's still stuff to it that I would change, and I'm not sure what exactly is going to happen with it in the future if it's going to be released or mm-hmm. whatever. But it's still one of those things of like once it's to a point where you where it's completed, you're just like, yeah, okay, now I can move on to the next thing. Like, yeah, big weight lifted off of your shoulders. Yeah, and I have a I have a very single track mind where I I have a really difficult time working on multiple projects at once. I have a really hard time kind of shifting my focus from one thing to the next, and so as a result, I really need to like you know get everything off my plate for one thing before I can proceed to the next project, whatever that may be. So that's 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 another thing too. Um, kind of like I guess that that. Uh, ties into that sort of that looming sense uh, of something above me because once that's out of the way then it just allows me to focus my attention on on all the other stuff is, is that anything that that you can relate to at all or, or are you able to work on multiple projects at the I like same to time think I am at least <laughs> I yeah. I know for a fact though like it's very difficult for me to to truly get done multiple projects and to put in the proper amount of effort into each one cuz i know yeah. that if i'm if i'm trying to multitask it just doesn't work out well um like even when i'm doing like lesson plans for for school or whatever i have to be completely focused on that otherwise it's just going to be it's not going to be my best work yeah so like right now i'm going through and working on a a real big ebook project um and by real big i mean like 120 150 page ebook something like that oh Um, wow that's that's a pretty big one yeah so i'm 
slowly going through it, slowly putting together the pieces. And I know that if I don't give myself the time to do it, like I would love to have it released tomorrow, but mm -hmm. I know that I have to allow myself the the few months, say a spring deadline or so, where I have I know I have enough time to do it, where I can focus on it properly throughout multiple weeks, multiple months, but at the same time have a deadline where I know I need to get it finished by because of all the other stuff that I have to try and focus on. Yeah. I really, if I had nothing else to do, I could nail it down and get it done in a month. But because of my other stuff and because I'm terrible with multitasking, it's not going to work out like that. Yeah. Do you find that having a self-imposed deadline works for you as well as sort of a externally imposed deadline on a project do, do you do you are you able to stick to your no. own deadlines in, in no, that sense not at all <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's pretty bad i need to get better at at listening to my own deadlines because like even with my writings so for instance i have i have to get an article over to on landscape by about this time next month or so mm -hmm. and it's both an external deadline but also it's a very loose external deadline. So I kind of put a deadline yeah. of like beginning of December on myself. I'm like, I know I should really be starting this, but I think my big problem right now is I have so much other work that has to get done because of school, especially. And I have to do a bunch of yeah. observation hours. I have unit plans that I have to start writing up for that count as like my finals. Um, that kind of thing. So it's it's a juggling act at this point. And so my personal deadlines that I put on myself kind of keep getting pushed to the wayside in favor of external deadlines, which I think is always how it's going to happen. Yeah, yeah I, I think one of the one of the things since um, since I'm doing the the photography thing full time now is it's basically almost completely my own self imposed deadlines. Um, but I'm, I'm pretty good with them, but I, I think that's also just the way that I have everything structured. Uh, whereas, you know, you come back, you know, I'll come back from a trip and, and roughly about a month after coming back from the trip, I like to start posting the videos. And so that's, it's kind of like a, my own sort of deadline. This, this trip is a little bit different cause I'm working on the mailing out the portfolios and everything else like that too. Um, but I, I actually, I do pretty well with with self-imposed deadlines. Um, I, I'd say that they work for me about as well as uh, external deadlines, just as just so long as that they are uh, done realistically. Right. Um, I think that's that's where things get to be a little bit difficult if if it is a a deadline that's just completely not realistic. It's just, you know, that's it's, I just know that that's not even feasible. Um, but but sometimes it's also difficult to know how long it'll take to complete a specific pro a project if you know if you haven't done that before if you don't know realistically how long it's going to take to do yeah that's kind of like with this ebook just trying to figure out a deadline that is appropriate for it can be really difficult when yeah. it's the first one that I've ever done that's to this degree so it's making sure that I give myself enough time to get it done where it's not, where I'm not constantly stressed out over it, constantly worried about, oh, am I, am I going to be able to meet this self-imposed deadline? But at the same time, not giving myself a year or a full year to get it done where I'm just procrastinating. Is it going to be more of like an art themed or is it more of like an educational themed? Like what's the, I, I, you, I know, you know, you may not want to give away all the details, but like what's sort of the, 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 the basis of, of the, it's e going to be an educational themed ebook. Yeah. Nice. So it's going to go through um, a bunch of different resources, um, a couple how to kind of articles, um, a little bit of history behind some photography aspects, that kind of thing. Um, at the end of the day, it should be pretty solid. Um, I know that 
I want to get a couple different uh, photographers within the black and white photography realm to mm-hmm. to look at it and to give me feedback on the whole ebook itself. So I know that I need to a lot like a month or so into that time frame. Yeah. So that that way I can get that feedback, give them time. Not that it's like, oh, hey, you need to get back to me, read this whole thing in two days and give me feedback. But more so I have like a month or so that I can get that feedback, get um, any changes that need to get made to it. Yeah. And also for, for something of that length, I mean, the ones that I've done are, are typically you know, like 30, 40 pages. I mean, they're, they're not going to be as, as, as detailed as that. Um, and some of the ones I work on, I mean, like it'll, it'll take me like a year and a half to do. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, that's definitely something that's going to involve, um, a lot of work. I, um, for the, uh, the journal entries I kept for my trip to Zion, um, what I'm thinking about doing is not printing that one as a zine, but doing that um, as an ebook and probably putting it on my Patreon uh, for the people there to, to check it out, just to kind of get a feel for it. Because I, I don't think it's going to be a, as polished as it can be as I get a better feeling for how everything comes together. Um, but I don't think that one's going to take very long to do because it's really just scanning in the journal entries and then laying that out with, uh, the film that's going to be on the facing page, which I'll photograph on my light box to get all the edges on it and such. So I don't think it's going to take a lot of work to do. I don't think it's going to be, uh, I think it's a sort of thing where all the work is really done mostly in advance in terms of just taking the time to write the journal entries and to, you know, take the photos in the field. But I also could be just wildly mistaken by the time I start throwing it together. I'm like, all right, this is, this is taking way longer than I thought it would. I think the nice thing, though, with a project like that is, so Sarah Marino has been doing these ebooks, free ebooks of uh, collections of images. I don't know if you've seen mm-hmm. those. I I just saw one of her posts about it yesterday. I don't know if it was on Twitter, but it, it was probably on Twitter that I saw. Yeah. yeah, she has one for black and white photography from Death Valley, along with another separate one that's. Um, more of like intimate her flower kind of abstraction scenes that kind of thing Mm -hmm. she was telling the uh, one discord group that i mentioned earlier that she just had a template that she built out for it and then it just becomes you open up that blank template and you plug everything in and then you export it and you're done so it's like a maybe hour two hour long process versus a 10 hour or multi-day process so I think that eventually is going to be what your zine or journal entry kind of project could become very easily. So yeah. it may be a couple of days or a couple of weeks that you're tweaking things, trying to figure out your template and all that. But then once you have that down, it's just a matter of the rest of them are a couple of minutes or however, depending on how much. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's very true. Cause that's, that's exactly how it was for doing the eBooks. The first one I did, um, you know, I'd have the content in terms of this is the photo I want on this page. This is the the copy that I want on this page. And, you know, the, the titles, the headlines and all that sort of stuff. And and then I, on that first one, I was sort of creating individual layouts depending on the content that was going on that page. Um, and then you end up being creative at times because maybe you have, you know, a bit more text than one page can handle so you break it into two pages then you need to fill some space with an image and all kinds of stuff like that um, but by the time i got to the the second ebook i was really borrowing a lot of the um, the format of the first one and then i sort of created some more um, pages depending on the needs of the the content with of the book and by the third one I did, I basically had most of all the layouts done where I would just, you know, grab one, copy and paste and drop in the pictures, drop in the type. And it just, the, the third ebook, I think I put it together in about a day and a half. Yeah. Um, but it took me about a year and a half to write it and to come up with all the examples and to all that sort of stuff. But that process where everything starts going together, where all the pieces start snapping into place and where you can actually visualize how it's going to to a look 
man, I, I love that process. It's, it's really rewarding seeing everything come together in that last stage. I mean, even if it just is like a digital product, like as much as I would love to have every one of my creations be physical, be printed out. Yeah. It's still so rewarding to, to look at a final product, even on a computer screen and be like, yeah, this, all of this effort was worth it. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's, it's a format that you, you have to kind of slow down and absorb a bit more, I think, which is so much different than, you know, so many other presentations, whether it's images on a website or social media or, or whatever, it's something about that format where it just makes you slow down a little bit and absorb it differently. And so that's one of the things I'm definitely attracted to by it. I think one of the other things that's going to help me out with mine is even though it's three or four times bigger than what yours typically are in terms of page length, I also write a lot more than you do, or at least yeah, to the public eye, I do. Yeah. So I think me being able to just rip through a couple different articles plus a lot of what I'm finding as I'm just doing basic layouts right now is mm -hmm. there's going to be a lot of pages where it's just of examples to show what I'm talking about rather than full on text, which is going to make things yeah. quite a bit easier depending on how I decide on the final layout and everything. So it's still going to be a lot of work, but it's going to be very, very rewarding once it's finally put together. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. That is that's for sure. Uh, so of the, uh, the various topics that we've come up, um, we, so basically for the people listening, which is everyone listening, <laughs> really, um, I, I guess unless you're not people, maybe there's a dog listening somewhere. Um, but this, you know, they should pay attention to this too. Uh, so we have this, this Google Docs where basically we put di different topics on there. And so there's been one on there for... Uh, a little while now, which I think is probably a good time to to get to it now, which I wrote this down back, I don't know, it was probably in the, the springtime when I, when I wrote this down. And it is difficult seasons to photograph. And I wrote that down because for me, summer is difficult. Spring is a little bit difficult. If you look at the trips I go on, I'm very productive during the winter. I'm very productive during the fall. But spring and summer are are tough ones for me, probably somewhat because of the locations that I that I tend to visit. Uh, but I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that. It was in May that you had written that down. There you go. I I, I figured it was after coming back from my spring trip where I got one photo I liked. Yeah, May eighteenth <laughs> at four o five p.m. Well, that's my time, so probably like one o five p.m. your time, something yeah. around there. That, that's probably right after I got my uh, my film back from the lab. I'm looking at it, I'm like, oh, man, the spring is rough. The spring is tough. Yeah. Yeah, for me, I think my most difficult season is winter. As weird as that seems, because there's like, that's when you tend to have a decent bit of separation in the woodlands for when you actually get snowfall and all that. Mm -hmm. But my big thing, like right now we're going into the grips of winter it's like 40 degrees outside right now it's windy and cold we have flurries here and there throughout the week already it's i i love the season but at the same time i can feel just the um i guess i could call it like seasonal depression uh creeping in the whole what they call mm -hmm. sad um seasonal affective disorder yeah creeping into you the your system because it's cold I don't want to go outside, but now I'm sat here at my desk for eight to 10 hours or whatever, just staring at a screen, whether it's my computer screen, the TV, my phone, whatever, um, and not being able to go out and enjoy the weather near as much. And I think a lot of that is also affected by when it does snow and when you really do want to be out there with your camera or just to even enjoy nature my Corolla is not the best in snow. <laughs> oh, that's definitely going to be a limiting factor in terms of just sheer accessibility for yeah. sure. So now it makes one of those things of, oh yeah, I could go out today. They're calling for snow. I could get stuck into a blizzard an hour and a half away. 
and be stuck there for a day, depending on yeah the conditions around there and all of that. I mean, already going to going to classes on luckily it's just every Tuesday night, but in the past when I've gone to classes, it's a forty minute drive and then I'll come back home. It may take me an hour and a half during a bad snowstorm because people don't know how to drive in the snow, even in Pennsylvania. And yeah. so everything gets backed up and back roads are always hectic. And then I get to my driveway and my driveway is quite long and steep. So my car doesn't like to try and make it up that. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll have I'll have to get my dad to uh, come down to the bottom of the driveway with a tractor and a and a thick quilt and he helps push me up the driveway it's a whole ordeal so wow yeah so it's it's one of those seasons where i'm just like i really want to enjoy it and i try to enjoy it as much as i can but if you look at my portfolio there's like no winter scenes because of that reason so there's yeah there's a lot of factors going into it and i think that's why it contributes to be my most difficult season i mean from a photographic standpoint, yeah, it can be great because, like I said, of that separation. But you also have those same difficulties as you do in winter or as in summer, rather, where it's just a little bit the opposite. So in summer, you have everything's green, everything's lush. It's hard to get those tonal separations. And mm -hmm. now you have the opposite of it where it's just as difficult because everything's brown, everything's dead. Yeah, and it's until you get snowfall, and even then, now it's brown and white. So it sounds like a good chunk of it is a for you is a a drop in motivation caused by you know just the the conditions combined with um, accessibility. Yeah. Um, if you if you were motivated, and if you did have accessibility. Do you think the subjects that you would find during the winter time would be worth the effort, or do you feel like the subjects just aren't quite as as good as the other times of the year when you prefer shooting? Like, if you were to remove all the the, the obstacles that make it difficult, do you think it would still be not quite as good as some of the other seasons for you, or do you think you would? be able to enjoy it more and be productive during those times. I'd definitely still be able to be productive. It's, it is strictly an accessibility standpoint and motivational standpoint. Yeah. Um, more so on the accessibility side. If I had like a, yeah. something that was all wheel drive or four wheel drive where I didn't have to worry so much about getting st like stuck, not being able to get home or whatever. Um, yeah then things would be considerably easier and I'd definitely get out a lot more. At the end of the day, the entire it, looking at it from a photographic standpoint, the entire year is can be deemed a, a difficult season, especially if you look at my output compared to a lot of other photographers, especially those using digital and shooting in color. Mm -hmm. I mean, this entire year, I don't think I've released a single image that I've taken yet. I have some in the backlog that I'm still working through and plan to release, but I may release five images this year, 10 at the most. And to a lot of people, like I look at Matt Payne and I see his releases from a trip that he just did in October that he just went through and edited. Yeah. There was some beautiful stuff in that one for oh, sure. Yeah. I looked at that. I'm like, Oh man, that's some They're good They're absolutely stuff. beautiful. But then you look at it and you're like, how are you doing this? Like, how are you coming away with 40, 50, 60 beautiful images when I'm going out and I'm taking like one for a month kind of deal as, as an average? Yeah. So yeah, I, I, I yeah. definitely think it's an accessibility standpoint, but it, and my output still wouldn't really change though, I don't think. Now, do you think that digital photographers who are able to capture a large volume of, you know, really solid images. I wonder what their perspective is looking at a photographer that produces just a handful of images each year. And they might be 
you know, pretty good images, you know, really good solid images. But if, if they, I, I'm curious what their perspective is, whether it, there's a grass is greener sort of thing going on where they're like, man, this person took eight photos this year and they're all very good. You know, is, is I wonder if they're like, man, I had to take, you know, 2000 photos to get, you know, 50 that are good. And this person took eight and they're all good. You know, I, I kind of wonder what the feeling is from the other side, looking towards those that don't take many photos. Yeah, I'd be curious to hear what people listening think about that because I know that when I was shooting digital, I was photographing quite a bit more. I was coming away with 50 to 100 photographs in just a day trip versus now I come away with maybe one, if any at all. Yeah. And out of those 50 to 100 or however many, my keeper rate was the same as what it is now. Maybe one, maybe two, maybe none. If anything, it just made me more disciplined, and it definitely helped me to uh, get a better grip on what it is I enjoy photographing, what subjects I actually want to go after, what feelings and emotions I want to try and convey. But yeah, I'd be curious if you have, for those listening, if you have any thoughts on... Dogs included. Yes, dogs included. <laughs> if you have a fish, if a, let the fish try and type out their thoughts. Um, as long as they don't lose them too quick. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, hop over onto the Discord and uh, let us know what you think on that. I'd be curious. And and also, I mean, just thinking about that, the for me, there's there's a very involved process in getting to know an image, um, where there's the initial reaction and it kind of changes with time. And I would think that if I am taking a lot of photos that I'm not going to be able to go through that process. I'm not going to be as invested in each image. Exactly. And and I don't, I just think that e even if for some freak reason I could work the exact same way I do with an 8x10 camera, and but just film is unlimited and free and all that sort of stuff where I don't have to worry about, you know, how many photos I'm taking and all that sort of stuff. You know, if, if I were to have a a huge stockpile of images... I just don't think I would have enough time to really appreciate them, to get to know them, and to maybe to see beyond that initial impression on an image that sometimes isn't really how I will view that image with time. When I do the, the film reveal videos on my YouTube channel, usually if I'm left feeling a little bit unsettled afterwards, and I kind of feel like, oh, you know, I don't really have anything great from this trip. I, I don't, I'm not very proud of the work I did. I, I've learned to realize that that sort of feeling is one that means I actually do have some good stuff there. And I just have to take some time to get to know the images. And they will perhaps be some of my, you know, they'll have a longer lasting appeal than the ones that just have that initial shock value that you gravitate towards and select that image over perhaps a different one that may be a little bit more subtle at first. But then it's, it's just sort of like those, you know, the images that stand on social media are the loud images, the ones that shout at you, the ones that shout above all the other images. But they may not have the lasting appeal. I just don't feel like I would have the ability to get to know the images in the way that I would like if I shot a lot more images. And then also going back to the difficult seasons, I, I think, I mean, for me, summer is tough just because so many of the places I love are either a million degrees and perhaps tremendous flash flood risks to be in certain areas, or they're crowded with people it's just, it's really a tough situation for me to work. And so spring is also a bit tough uh, because of the places I visit, especially during the spring, I like to do the backpacking trips. Um, weather is very, very important for those. So there's a very narrow window to go to some of those areas where, where the weather is still very nice and reasonable and everything. And, you know, you're not going to freeze, you're not going to burn up. So spring and, and, and summer are tough for me. Uh, but fall, man, I just love the variety of subjects and things change so much from year to year. And I think that's 
part of the process of returning to a location again and again. And then the same thing with winter. I, I think it's because you get change on a small scale, you know, change with the, the small subjects at your feet. And so I'm always very productive there. I got to get better at it during the spring. But, but yeah, summer is a tough one. That's the toughest one for me, at least in, in the areas where I photograph. Yeah, I mean, summer for summer and spring are probably my most productive because the weather is starting to get warmer. <laughs> so I'm, I'm complete opposite yeah. from you. Uh, but the yeah. weather is getting starting to get warmer, especially in spring. You have all of like the, the flowers and everything that starts to bloom. So you start to the the wood starts to really come back to life, start to open back up again. And you have all these different little subjects that you can photograph. The the ferns start coming back and look just brilliant, especially after a, a light rain. And then you get into summer, and summer becomes a little bit more difficult because that lack of separation that I mentioned. But that's, for me at least, that's when I have the most free time. That's when I'm out camping the most because the weather is obviously the nicest. Yeah. And that challenge, honestly, I love of trying to find those separation points, the intimate details, the images or the compositions that whisper at you and beckon you closer versus the grand vistas and the vibrant colors of like the fall or the amazing storms that we may get during the winter. So I think that's a big thing that's played more into my photography recently especially uh, that a lot of the images that I take and that I love the most are the ones that are very quiet kind of images the ones that whisper yeah. versus the ones that shout but I think like you had mentioned that they don't grab your attention near as often or near as strong yeah you got to give them time to to sort of get to know them and to to, to explore the things that are not as easily noticed just on a first glance. Which makes it really difficult for getting attention to your work and getting people to yeah. better understand it, especially these days. Like You go through social media and it's all just a ton of shouting images just screaming at you the entire time. And then you go through and all of a sudden you come up to like one of my work my works or maybe yours or someone else's where it's it's a lot quieter more intimate of a scene and you just kind of eh that doesn't they don't compare and that's the problem is people are always going to be comparing those two when you just you can't yeah and it is i i do think that we're starting to see the pendulum shift back um because i i feel like with the way that things are right now with social media I feel like it's gone too far in the direction where, you know, people are, are stretching mountains and adding fake birds and doing all that sort of stuff. And I, I think things have gone too far in that direction and things are shifting back towards photographing the smaller scenes, the more subtle sort of subjects. And I, I'm not quite sure what that all is in reaction to. Maybe it just the the challenge of of you know producing those sort of images the attention grabbing images maybe some of the thrill of doing that the challenge of that since it's so much more accessible now has kind of gone away a little bit and that's one of the reasons why uh, so many photographers are going back towards the small scenes again um, but it also makes me wonder where things are going to go from there uh, whether it's going to swing back to the grand landscapes maybe there'll be some technological innovation that spurs something or some new I don't I mean I don't even know if it's going to be like a result of social media I mean I'm not on TikTok I have zero interest <laughs> for TikTok but when I when I see the 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 reels or, or the the TikTok stuff made into reels on Instagram that creeps into the feed and all that sort of stuff where people just with because of the short attention span they they have I don't know like 20 pictures that flash you know a picture every split second just flash through all these images and and it seems like the attention span is getting shorter and shorter and shorter um, but it does have me wondering where things are going to go from here 
Um, but I, I imagine it will probably be shaped by the method in which the work is viewed. But also, you know, as you had mentioned earlier, where uh, Sarah Marino was uh, posting some of the portfolios of her work as the, you know, free eBooks, that sort of thing is, it's a nice way of viewing the work in a, a quieter, calmer sort of environment away from social media, away from everything else. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if that becomes even more of a trend and if that will perhaps in some way shape the work. But it'll be interesting to see where things go. I think Alex Noriega had mentioned it before about everything is going to be swinging back and forth through time. And you look mm -hmm. at all of the art trends and they all come full circle. I mean, even, even yeah. look at... Uh, society and how like my generation the younger generation as a whole are starting to embrace some of the things from like the 1920s yeah everything's coming back around things that my parents and my grandparents knew and loved when they were kids are now starting to pop back up again and i think art is much the same in that degree so where exactly the pendulum is going to swing next is going to be interesting to see it's not necessarily predictable i don't think at yeah. least not by me maybe by someone much smarter <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah but uh but i i yeah. am curious uh i don't i don't know that it'll swing straight back to grand landscapes anytime soon though especially with the introduction of ai and a lot of the scenes that are being created with that are at least seemingly from what i've seen so far very much so like grand landscapes the shouting kind of scenes yeah but who knows so speaking of of movements and of of change yeah, we nice have transition. a uh, i know right i was working <laughs> on that one for a while um i have a uh on for over from on our discord there is a, a topic suggestion from roger and he says how about movement yeah, we have smoothed out water and maybe clouds as a convention in much landscape photography, but few people use movement as a subject. Why is the movement of a branch always considered to ruin a shot and so rarely used as a device in a still? And so what what are your thoughts on 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 movement as a subject? I try to embrace it when I can and when it fits the image so i know for from seeing your videos and seeing you work in the field that a lot of the times you are waiting for the wind to die down so that you yeah. don't have a ton of movement i mean your book is what between the wind or yeah exactly yeah so uh i'm kind of i let the image tell me what it needs more than anything else so for instance i was out couple weeks ago maybe two weeks ago went down to a local park and um, I saw this scene of a white tree up against a bunch of brown uh, trees in the background with um, some wheat or long field grass in the front in the foreground mm -hmm. there and it was decently windy I had a choice at that point I could have waited for that wind to die down and used a shutter speed that was fast enough to freeze all motion or I could have embraced that motion that was already happening and I chose to embrace it now mm -hmm. I I can't speak for the image because I haven't developed it yet but that's kind of how I play with most of my images is I will just let the composition tell me what it needs more than anything else so I'm not necessarily against having a moving branch or something unless it becomes a distraction. If it's if that is the only thing moving in the scene, then yeah, it can ruin it. Yeah. But if there's enough motion in the scene that it helps it instead, then I have no issues with it. Yeah, for me, it's all about it being intentional um, from the standpoint that in, in a lot of the areas where I photograph, if there's a little bit of a breeze, 
And if there's a little bit of movement on, let's say like the branch of a maple or a box elder or, or some sort of tree, if there's just a little bit of movement, it becomes a distraction and it doesn't look intentional. It looks like a mistake as opposed to a creative decision. When I went on my recent fall trip, there was one day where there was a little bit of wind, um, not a lot, but there was a little bit of wind. And there was this really beautiful maple that I wanted to photograph. And so I had set up my camera. I was using a long lens just to fill the frame with all the, the branch structure and the leaves. It was like this really beautiful sort of reddish orange color. And ultimately the, the window for light coincided with when there were some clouds going over. And when the clouds go over, the light gets really flat. Um, and also wind came with the clouds as well, but it wasn't a lot of wind. It's just a little bit of wind. So I was thinking I should wait for a sizable gust of wind. And even though the light's not amazing right now, I'll trigger the shutter when, you know, if I can get the shutter speed down to like a, a second or so, or, you know, some, somewhere where this whole tree is just moving like crazy in the wind, but I never quite even had the ability to make the wind motion look intentional because it really wasn't windy enough and I couldn't get my shutter speed long enough. So it would have just been this awkward middle range where it just doesn't quite look right. Um, so from my standpoint, if I'm going to show movement, I want it to be a lot of movement. I want it to be very intentional looking and I want it to contribute positively to the image. But most of the time, the sort of movement that I see in the subjects, when I do have a photo with and without movement, I pretty much always reach for the one without movement because it portrays a sense of still and it portrays a sense of calm, which is really more representative of the subject when I was standing there. Um, and so, and, and also this isn't to say that all of my photos are free of wind. There's, there's some photos I've taken, especially on backpacking trips where there's a little bit of wind and that's fine. But just so long as it, it contributes positively to the image as opposed to looking just like a distraction. Um, so that's, that's kind of where I come from for that. I really do need, need to carry my ND filters a little bit more in the field. Um, so I can stretch out those exposure times. Uh, if I had those on that day um, in Zion on my past trip, I probably could have uh, taken a kind of a cool photo with the the movement of the branches and the wind. Um, the other thing too is that with film, you know, I can't just take a bunch of photos and see which one looks best and experiment with the different shutter speeds. You kind of just get the opportunity to take one or two, and it doesn't lead to a lot of experimenting in terms of what shutter speeds can give their best movement and knowing if you got that. So it also gets kind of expensive. So that's, that's kind of where I come from that, where it, it oftentimes just comes off looking like a mistake as opposed to a, a something that's intentional. Yeah. Thinking on that shutter speed aspect and ND filters, I could not imagine using those for most of my photography anymore. I used to use a, uh, a 10 stop ND, especially for waterfalls mm -hmm. and such. But like you had mentioned, it's, it gets very expensive when you can't see what you're getting and what timing is going to be best for yeah. those specific images. So you're kind of, whenever I'm photographing a waterfall these days, I'm kind of leaving it up to fate. Like, okay, this is going to expose my shadows where I want them, put my highlights where I want them. The water movement is just, it's going to be what it is. Um, and I can I can get a basic judgment on the movement just by looking at it and like timing things out in my head, especially when you get towards dimmer light where your exposure times are like fifteenth of a second, a second, that kind of thing. Yeah, you can kind of see and start to get a feel for what's going to be a movement, what's not. But like I said, though, I think it all comes down to not only your intentions as a photographer so like for you you wanting to keep everything kind of still and kind of how peaceful yeah. and calm whereas with me i'm i'm fine with embracing the chaos because as a woodland photographer there's a lot of times where i have to yeah you're surrounded by chaos and so right so i have to 
just let the image tell me what it needs and just trust in that that it's the right decision at the right time yeah and i th- i think that's that alone the idea of trusting your decision at that point in time it's the biggest difference between photographing digitally versus with film because you don't get that immediate response you don't get that immediate um, feedback that can tell you okay this decision that i made right here and, and now was wrong so now i have to change it yeah instead you kind of just have to take a almost like a zen like approach and just what it is is what it is yeah and i think there's a, a fair amount of comfort that comes in that uh, absolutely because there's there's less variables to control like in the times when i'm photographing around water i'm thinking more about what do i need for depth of field you know and then it's just a matter yeah. of what what film iso i'm at and that just gives me my shutter speed and that's my shutter speed i'm not i'm not concerned about trying to have like the perfect settings i think by shooting film especially with a large format you have to embrace some degree of imperfection in the work but i think that's also what makes it oftentimes feel more real um that little little bit of unpolishedness which it which just gives it that extra little bit of a sense of reality and and i i do enjoy that part of it i hope you enjoyed our creative banter you can learn more about cody's work by visiting his website codyschultz.com and you can find my work at benhorn.com for further discussion join us at patreon.com slash creative banter it's a place where we can interact with you the listener and although we greatly appreciate those who contribute by joining a tier discussions are open to everyone whether you're a paying member or not Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you around next time.